What's going on, everyone? Welcome to part 10 of our Keyshot Essential series. My name's Kareem Merchant, and in this video, I'll be opening up the render settings window and covering the basics of setting up your scenes for final output. Whether you followed along with our Keyshot Essential series or are just tuning in, you've most likely reached a point where you have a scene that is close to, if not ready to be rendered out. The first step to finalizing and rendering out your Keyshot projects is locating and opening the render settings window. There are three ways to open the render settings window. The first is the render icon located on the bottom toolbar. By clicking on the icon, a separate render window will appear in the center of your screen. The render window can also be accessed by using the shortcut Control P or by opening the window from the render menu at the top of the program window. With the render window open, you'll notice that we have three different settings tabs along the left side column. Since we are discussing the basics of outputting your renders, we are only going to focus on the top two, Output and Options. Let's start by looking at the Output settings. Under the Output settings, you'll find controls for parameters such as Image Format, Resolution, File Paths, and Layers. And if you look across the top of the window, you can set output parameters for still images, animations, XRs, and configurators. Again, since we are focusing on the basics, I'm only going to be discussing still image settings and animation settings. But if you are interested in learning more about XRs and configurators, check out our advanced series episodes covering those specific topics. Let's take a look at our still image settings. The first thing you'll notice in the still image settings is the name output field near the top. You can use this field to rename your renders, and directly to the right, you can select whether your files will be numbered or non-numbered, as well as customize how the labeling appears. Below the input field, you can also designate which number the current file will be saved as, and you'll be able to see a preview of how that file will appear. Under the file name preview, you can manually input a file path you would like to save your renderings to, or you can use the folder icon on the far right to browse for a location. If you select the Format dropdown, you'll notice eight different options available. All of these, aside from JPEG, will allow you to save renders with the option to include an alpha channel for transparency. If you select the PSD option, you'll have the ability to add selected layers or passes to your Photoshop document by toggling the checkbox under the Layers and Passes accordion. Below the Format options, you'll find a checkbox that includes metadata as well as image size options that can be designated via resolution or print size. Both can be controlled by manually inputting width and height information or by selecting a preset resolution from the preset dropdown to the right. You also have the ability to designate units of measurement and DPI when making adjustments to print size. There are two accordions available under still images, the first being layers and passes. Under the Layers and Passes accordion, you will find a series of checkboxes corresponding to the different elements that make up your image. As you can see, these represent elements such as lighting, reflections, and shadows. By selecting these passes, you are creating individual renders of each element so that they can be independently controlled in post-processing. A little quick tip when using passes is that they work most efficiently when rendered in a PSD format. As I mentioned a moment ago, when a PSD format is selected, the Add to PSD option appears in the accordion. This allows us to render out a Photoshop document with all desired passes saved as separate layers embedded in the file. This makes post-processing incredibly efficient. There are quite a few options available, and if you're unfamiliar with what they do, it can definitely be a little overwhelming. If that is the case, I recommend getting started by using the Clown Pass. This pass essentially creates an image where each material is displayed as a flat color for easy selection and masking in Photoshop. This makes isolating parts of your image for editing simple and highly efficient. Below that, we have Region Render Settings. Region Render is a great tool if you are experiencing hotspots or other artifacts in your scene. By using this tool, a specific area of your image can be rendered and overlaid in post-production to correct an issue. It can also be used to determine how many samples might be required for that area's artifacts to be resolved. This accordion is not one that I use too often, but it's definitely a nifty tool to keep in your back pocket. You can either control it by inputting numerical information in the fields, or by manually manipulating the region in your real-time view. Alright, let's take a look at our animation settings next. To open your animation settings, you'll first need to have an animation assigned in your timeline. If you don't have one set up yet, don't worry. I'm going to briefly cover the settings just to get you familiar with the window. 
Then I'll touch on them again in our next video, which will focus on setting up animations. Our animation settings in many ways are very similar to our still image settings. The most notable difference being the video output and frames format checkboxes. At the very top, you can set your video resolution manually or use the preset dropdown on the right. And just below that are options to render out a specific time range, your designated work area, or a specified frame range. With your video output checkbox selected, you can rename your video output, select how your file numbering appears, choose a destination folder, and change the format of your video output. If you look under the format dropdown, there are six listed options, five of which are for full length video formats and one for creating animated GIFs. Next, we have the frames output checkbox. This checkbox allows you to output individual frames of your video as images, which you can recompile as video later. You'll notice that the frames output settings are nearly identical to the still image settings I introduced you to earlier. You can also find the familiar layers and passes and region accordions in this settings window as well. The last portion of the render window I'd like to cover is the options tab. With the tab open, you have access to the render mode and quality settings, which apply to all render tabs in the output settings we just spoke about. Along the top, there are three render modes to choose from. The first is default, which will prioritize your CPU or GPU usage over your program's real-time view. It will also trigger a render output window to open, which will give you a preview of your render's progression. Note that when rendering in default, you cannot use other program operations. Notice how I am unable to deselect pause when the render window is open. The second is background. When selected, the background render mode will essentially work the same as default mode. However, the render output window and real time view will be independent from one another. Using this render mode, you can unpause your scene and continue working in the real time view while still actively rendering. If you do decide to use this mode to render while working, consider reducing your core count both in your render output and in your real-time view to help prevent unwanted crashes. You could also, for instance, render in CPU while using the real-time view in GPU. The last render mode located on the top is Send to Network mode. This option is only available as a purchased add-on, but it allows you to send renders to a network of two or more computers. By using this add-on, you can significantly speed up render time as well as reduce your primary computer's workload. All three render modes have a render engine dropdown where you can set your render to output using GPU or CPU. By default, this dropdown will be set to match whatever engine you are using to drive your real-time view. Below that, you have another dropdown to set your CPU or GPU usage as well as a checkbox to match the usage from your real-time view. And finally, let's take a look at our quality settings. Essentially, all of these will determine how long your render will take to output. Here you have three sets of quality settings. Under maximum samples, you can set the number of passes Keyshot will make to render out your image. This is definitely what I would recommend using when you aren't under a time crunch. I typically render out quick images using 200 to 400 passes and can even go as high as 1400. Unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly how many samples to use for your projects because it will ultimately depend on scene complexity and computer hardware. However, I would recommend starting in the 200 to 400 range and working your way up or down from there. Next, we have maximum time settings. This is an incredibly handy tool when you're under a tight deadline or just need to make some quick renders to demonstrate an idea. Here you can set rendering time per frame or by total duration. Adjusting any one of these parameters will cause the others to adjust accordingly. And lastly, we have our custom controls. These controls give us one final chance to adjust some of the scene's parameters. From here, you can adjust samples just like you would under the maximum sample settings, but you can also adjust things such as ray bounces, anti-aliasing, shadow qualities, and global illumination. There are also options to toggle on or off sharp shadows, sharper texture filtering, and global illumination cache. By default, sharp shadows and global illumination cache will be toggled on and you can manually toggle sharper texture filtering to preserve details when rendering at grazing angles. This option will increase render time, so definitely take that into consideration when rendering your final images. At this point, once your settings have been finalized, go ahead and click the render button on the bottom right to start rendering out your final images. Before we go, I just wanted to bring attention to our online Keyshot manual. 
If you're ever in doubt about what a specific function in Keyshot does, or you have questions about terminology, I highly recommend checking it out. It's packed full of incredibly useful Keyshot information, and it's a great place to start with when you're looking for answers. And if for some reason you can't find an answer to your question, you can always get in contact with our support team by visiting www.keyshot.com and entering the support portal under the resource tab. As always, thanks for watching this episode of Keyshot Essential Series. In part 11, I'll be giving you a basic rundown of Keyshot's animation capabilities. So if you are interested in learning more about creating eye-catching animations, definitely check out our next episode. Don't forget to let us know your thoughts on this tutorial in the comment section below. And if you found this video useful, give it a like and share with your friends.